Well, it is eight o'clock and we, this is like school. We start on time and we end on time. We honor, um, time is our most precious commodity. So we don't like to waste it. Um, hi everybody. My name is Lisa Wagner. I have had the privilege and pleasure of working for AEI for 10 years now believe it or not, although I haven't aged at all. And although Chris and I haven't met um, in talking about the election and, and the red wave that turned into a pink flag, the one thing um, his colleagues at AEI have said is that Chris is awesome. Literally, that was the only description they gave. And in reading his Wikipedia page, um, and all that he has done in his life. He's the author of two books. He's an expert on pop populism. Um, I think when he hears the, the word Arizona, you may get some PTSD a little bit. Ah. Uh, a commentator on Fox News. I mean, he's, just, he's in the epicenter of everything that has impacted our country over the past, um, I'd say, two, two years especially, but long before that as well. Um, a, for those of you who aren't familiar with AEI, and most of you are, AEI was started in the 1930s when people were concerned about socialism. Sound a little familiar? And it's dedicated to free enterprise, strong national defense, and all things good and holy. How about that? Um, they are my um, North Star when it comes to policy. They allow for a competition of ideas which is a rare treat, and they know how to argue without being disagreeable. So with that being said, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Chris, you're going to give about 10 to 15 minutes on whatever you want to talk about. If any of you have questions, just raise your hand or um, put it in the chat, and we'll take it one by one. We've already had one question submitted already. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I'll turn it over to you, Chris. And Chris, thank you for joining well, it's certainly my pleasure to be with you guys today. Uh, and I, I agreed with and liked everything that you said, except for that I am awesome, uh, because I don't need to drag those expectations into our, and I have my coffee, uh, into our coffee and conversation. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. I think um, I could not have been happier uh, personally or professionally with the outcome of the midterm elections. And here is why. Three reasons. First and most important, I was right. And that's, I think, what we should all really take away from 2022. Chris was right. Okay, good. Got that. Fine. Next, we conducted the election without any serious problems. Um, Carrie Lake uh, fluttered a bit in Arizona, but generally speaking, uh, the winners won and the losers lost. Uh, it took an in interminable amount of time, again, for California to count its ballots, but all in all, uh, after a, a dicey period in which I was told by both parties that democracy was doomed, uh, democracy functioned in a very normal fashion in what appeared to be a very normal midterm. So that is the second good thing. And the third good thing, and this is where I run, I try not to, uh, as my old daddy used to say, opinions are luxury items, don't have more than you can afford. Uh, so I try not to have uh, too many opinions, but I was very pleased with the verdict of the voters because they didn't give either party anything. Uh, both of these parties are a mess. Uh, both of these parties are a, a, a hazmat zone right now. And nobody <laughs> has any particular, neither party was selling ideas. Right. Neither party was engaged in a, in a proactive discussion about policies that they wanted to put in place. Really, they were just saying the other guys were worse and voters seem to agree with them. So the split decision on the House and the Senate uh, and the low, uh, the small size of the majority in the House did a couple of things. It if Republicans had gotten the kind of um, result that Democrats got in 2018. Uh, that the Republicans got in 2014 and 2010, the cue to the Republican, the thinking inside the Republican Party would have been what? No need to change. We're good. We can just keep doing what we're doing and we can wait for uh, the other guy to, to, to die uh, and we'll be fine. We'll, we'll just benefit from the failures of the other side. 
And that didn't happen. So Republicans are for the first time in a long time taking a look at themselves, which is important because they have serious housekeeping to do. But if it had been different, just a little different, if Democrats had kept the House, right? If, if six seats had gone the other way, eight seats had gone the other way, uh, if the Democrats uh, had were heading to a 52 or 53 seat majority in the Senate, what would we be dealing with? Uh, Biden and he and the Democrats are are falling prey to this anyway. Uh, but the clear message from the voters was neither party passed the smell test, and that's really important because they both have serious housekeeping to do. Uh, we are going into a presidential election cycle where neither party really knows what it is. Um, the Democrats alit on Joe Biden in 2020 uh, for only one reason, because he was perceived, and you, by the way, saw uh, that Joe Biden put forward his list for the new Democratic primary uh, calendar, and South Carolina, which made him the Democratic nominee, uh, is right at the top of the list. He wants South Carolina, he wants Michigan uh, way up high. He wants states with large numbers of African-American voters because those are the voters that made Joe Biden the Democratic nominee. And it was for one reason, because they correctly understood that only Joe Biden was the strong choice to beat Donald Trump. Uh, if they would have followed what white liberals in and progressives and democratic socialists in New Hampshire and Iowa were talking about, uh, and we saw in the, in the relative closeness of the results in 2020 uh, that uh, Donald Trump would have beaten those folks, uh, that uh, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders would have been a, a, a train wreck for Democrats. So Democrats chose Joe Biden for just one reason, which is they wanted to beat Donald Trump. And that was the only mandate that Joe Biden had. Uh, and he, he fulfilled it on his first day in office and since then has been looking for one. Um, Democrats coming out of 2018 and the end of the Trump presidency believed that they were in a progressive moment, that they were the dawn of democratic socialism was here and that the super woke, super progressive, uh, all of that stuff was ascendant. Uh, and they have been through a series of hard lessons that that is not so. And we can look all around the country and see the evidence about what happens when we talk about crime, what happens when we talk about immigration. Uh, when, when you have the prosecuting attorney of San Francisco uh, recalled from office, uh, we know that we are not talking about uh, something that is limited to the provinces of the far right. So the Democrats don't know who they are or what they're doing. Uh, other than being opposed to Trump and Trumpism. On the Republican side, it's absolutely, uh, it, the meltdown continues apace, right? Uh, Republicans are at each other's throat. The astonishing divisions inside the Republican Party, the hatreds inside the Republican Party are so profound. And we just, all, all you have to do is look across. The, the United States Senate could have been 54 seats Republican easy, right? With good nominees in New Hampshire, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, in uh, Nevada, in Arizona. Nevada, okay. Uh, but Arizona, certainly. You, there are three seats right there. And Georgia is the saddest story of all for the Republicans. Because of their internal conflict, a red seat, which should be Republican by every account. If we look at how well Governor Brian Kemp did in Georgia, that's a Republican seat. And the Republicans just gave it away. They gave away a Senate seat in Arizona because they can't get over themselves. They really dislike each other and can't seem to unite behind uh, good candidates. And so the Republicans have, just like the Democrats looking into 2024, uh, they don't know who they are and they don't know what it's for. And uh, this is, I'll just say, we got here um, by believing that power itself was the only necessary thing, right? Um, we have backslid into a kind of politics just of power and not of ideas uh, and not uh, persuasion, but division. And this is a trend that started, you can time it to whatever point, the Iraq war, uh, you can time it to the 2008 election, but in modern, political life, 
These two parties have basically run on negative partisanship. Uh, Barack Obama ran for reelection in 2012, uh, not saying that he was great. I mean, he said he was great, but saying that Mitt Romney was a vampire and that if you elected him, he'd destroy the country. We've seen a little negative campaigning from incumbents in the past. George Bush wasn't exactly blowing John Kerry kisses, uh, but this was a, a, a way station on a long path down to extreme negative partisanship. And of course, the problem with negative partisanship is if you say that the other guy is the devil himself, right? Uh, and Joe Biden actually says it this way. He goes, don't judge me by the almighty, judge me by the alternative. Well, that's not good enough for America, right? That does not meet American standards for our republic, which is we don't need to judge you by the almighty, but we do need to judge you against the men and women who have come before you, right? And as I always like to say about the presidency, that's George Washington's job that you're applying for. So you better be worthy of your heritage and you better be worthy of your inheritance. So we have slid to the point where both parties say, not that they're great, but that the other guys are the worst and the other guys will destroy the country. And that is not a high enough standard. So we have reached sort of what I, or what I hope is the end of that process, right? I hope that we have uh, gotten to the point where the parties realize that they have to be about more than just saying the other people are racists or communists uh, and get into talking about how do we persuade persuadable voters? Because there's a lot of them. There's a third of the country out there that is ready to listen and ready to talk about solutions uh, to the problems that persist. And I'll just say this, and then we can get to the, we can get to the good stuff, we can get to your questions. The, the way that, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that um, Americans, uh, I'll put it like this, persuadable voters, those folks that are on the continuum from people who, and, and here's where I would tell you to think of somebody who voted for Joe Biden in 2000 or in 20, 2000, in, uh, in 2020, uh, but then voted for Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. Or think about the about 200,000 Georgians who voted for Brian Kemp for governor, but did not vote for Herschel Walker for Senate. Those are not liberal voters, right? Those aren't liberal voters. Obviously, Brian Kemp is very conservative. Um, and Glenn Youngkin is very conservative. These are not squishy or non-conservative Republicans. They're free market, they're pro-life, they're, it's, they're uh, open about their religious faith. They're those guys. Or we can look at Ron DeSantis's enormous success in Florida. We can look at how well he performed compared to the, when he ran four years ago. America's voters aren't moving left, but Republicans are failing to persuade them, right? They're failing to persuade them and they're failing to offer candidates that these folks can engage with. And as they have demonstrated in 2020, and as they demonstrated in Senate races, they will vote for Democrats, right? Uh, there is, they, they will go vote for Joe Biden. They will vote for Raphael Warnock. They will vote uh, for uh, Kelly in Arizona. They'll do it. Uh, and Republicans have to figure out how to get from here to there. Okay, so those are words that I said. What are words that you say? All right, we have a number of questions in the queue. We've had two texted in. Um, I'm going to channel my inner Bob Crawford here and ask a question he has asked many, many times over the years. Um, you wrote a book on populism, and the question is relates to populism and Trump. When do you think? Trump will go away is the question. Well, Trump uh, Trump will not go away. Uh, Trump is not a go away -er. Uh He is a hanger, a last dog is hung, hanger on her. Um, and, you know, first, I'll t you know, here's, here's the, why do we have all these populist revolts in America? Well, in part, it's because that between the Iraq war and the panic of 2008 and the ensuing uh, recession. Um, a lot of Americans thought that we were getting hosed, right? A lot of Americans thought that this was really a disaster uh, and that the elite consensus uh, that came out of the end of the 20th century was bunkum. 
and they were mad. Uh, 4,300 dead in Iraq, uh, savings wiped out, retirements obliterated. Uh, the 21st century has not been great for America so far. And so some of it is the natural reaction to uh, the accurate assessment of uh, a struggling republic. So that's part of it. Now there's another part of it, which is we don't have a Congress. This is very unfortunate for a Republican, not for a Republic not to have a Congress. Um, what is the body, what is the entity that is supposed to be close, most closely tied to popular sentiment? The House of Representatives, right? And then the Senate, and then the presidency, and then the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is supposed to be almost completely removed from popular sentiment, but the House is supposed to be, because that's why they stand for election every two years. They call them representatives for a reason, right? They're supposed to be in touch with what people want, but our Congress doesn't want a Congress. Being Congress is really hard. Uh, because you have to do things that people don't like sometimes. Uh, and you have to make hard decisions. And when you have a hearing, for example, you might have to actually find facts instead of just give dumb little five minute speeches uh, that you hope somebody clips and puts on Twitter. Um, Congress doesn't want to be Congress. Members of Congress just want to stay. They just want to wear their dumb lapel pins and get good reservations at Charlie Palmer. And I want to get good reservations at Charlie Palmer too. So I'm, I dig it. I dig it. But uh, it's not good enough. And that's actually, by the way, why I, uh, as a longtime skeptic of term limits, now believe that term limits are a necessity uh, for uh, getting us back on track, because these, these guys and gals need a shot clock. Uh, and that's a big part of why all this populist anger is there, is because the entity that's supposed to be doing the work is not doing the work. Um, as for Trump himself, you know, it was a Faustian bargain that Republicans made about Trump. They knew that he was, you know, trouble but they thought he was good trouble uh, or worth it anyway, that he would be worth the trouble. And now he's not worth the trouble. And extricating themselves from this will be really hard because they don't want to alienate the voters. So the way I think about the Republican party goes like this. There's 20% of Republicans who are always Trump. They love Trump, they're in it, right? These are the bikers for Trump, people who show up for rallies a day early. These are, they love Donald Trump and they think it's awesome. Uh, there's 20% that are never Trump. They don't, they will not support Trump. They hate Trump. They're not going to vote for him in a primary, probably not even in a general. Uh, but the rest of the Republican party is what uh, you can call always Republican, right? They'd vote for Trump again over Biden, sure. Uh, and, but they would also vote for Ron DeSantis over Biden, or they would also vote for pretty much any Republican, uh, any mainstream Republican, over a Democratic candidate. So the, the challenge for Republicans is, it's a Mickey Mouse balloon, right? If you go too hard against Trump, right? Uh, those voters, the, the always Trump voters, rebel and they don't show up and they punish you. But as Republicans have now learned, the never Trump or Trump skeptical voters who are on, in the other ear of the balloon, uh, they, they won't show up if you keep trumping them. So for the mainstream Republicans who are always Republican, they just want Republicans to win and Democrats to lose, figuring out how to deal with this conflict is, is basically the central challenge. But Trump will never go away on his own. Trump, Donald Trump is not going to say, all right, guys, you said things, I said things, we'll just go on our merry way. Uh, he, he, if, if Republicans are going to be through with Donald Trump, it'll be them who has to break up with him, uh, not him with them. Bob, how'd I do in that question? Okay, I'll, I'll take that as a good. All right, uh, the next one is, um, and then the, we'll start going through the queue here. You wrote a book called Broken News, Why the Media Rage Machine Divides America and How to Fight Back. Uh, can you give the how to fight back answer for those who haven't read it? Um, Changes in the or the collapse of the news business from 2005 to 2015, 12, uh, was so thorough, especially on the local level, the destruction of newspapers around the country, 
uh, tens of thousands of newsroom jobs were lost across the country. Uh, and it created a vacuum. These dumb smartphones uh, changed the way that we understand information in really profound fashion. Uh, and when I started out as a newspaper man, I was right, it was the last days of the Raj. It was the very end of the era when you had a consensus really born out of the Second World War that was still in place at the end of the 20th century uh, that, that, we, that we were still using. Um, and when our model, which was we had information and we sold it to you, uh, when that ceased to work because the information became free, I mean, I thought people were subscribing to the newspaper to read my wonderful insights. Uh, as it turns out, they were subscribing to the newspaper to get movie listings, uh, the weather report, the stock quotes, uh, and the baseball box scores. And I was, I was but filler to run around the ads for mulch and Buicks. Uh, and that's okay. I would I'd do it again. Uh, I love it. Uh, and uh, sometimes we get to sneak in uh, some good stuff around uh, the mulch and the Buicks. But when uh, the internet came along and offered those things for free, uh, the news business collapsed and we replaced higher quality local news that was germane to the interests of people's lives with what? Argle bargle, blathery national political news. There is not much, as a person who has spent a long time in the national news business, there's just not that much national news. Uh, and the, the only reliable part of national news is my stuff, is politics. And let me tell you, I'm supposed to be the weatherman, right? I'm supposed to be the other thing. Here's the news. And now, Chris, what's going on with the wacky politicians? Well, this guy's up and that guy's down. And here's what's going on in this runoff. And back to you. Um, but instead, because there is so little national news, what has filled the void is low quality national political news. And the real problem here is in a super segmented media marketplace, uh, for example, in the, 19, in, in the early 1970s, something like two thirds of American households watched one of the three major met, uh, network newscasts every evening. Uh, tens of millions of people. Uh, now, nothing, right? The, the ratings for today's television shows are a laughable joke compared to uh, what uh, Walter Cronkite and the boys were getting back in the day. And what it means is that you have a narrow audience and you, are, you need to keep them captive. What happens over time is that you become captive. It's a, it's a form of regulatory capture. And you can't tell your audience what it doesn't want to hear because they might go away. Think about it this way. If um, a million fewer people watch the CBS Evening News uh, with Walter Cronkite, it was a blip. It was nothing, right? If a million fewer people watch Rachel Maddow, uh, she has lost two thirds of her audience. So her need and the need at Fox and the need at everywhere to keep these people wrapped and tied down uh, creates uh, perverse incentives when it comes to the news. Because the difference between news and entertainment is that sometimes I have to tell you what you don't want to hear. Um, if I'm entertainment, I can just tell you what you want to hear all the time. And we can always, it can always be uh, a sunny day. Uh, and too much of our news business now uh, is flattery and fluff and not enough uh, telling the truth to people so that they can functionally operate uh, this last best hope of earth. Thank you. And thank you for being a truth teller. Uh, with that, we have a number of different, <laughs> we have uh, a bunch of questions in the queue. We're gonna go first to Tom, um, in order, Tom Wheeler, uh, Jim Rolf, uh, who has a similar question as John Nana. Um, so Tom Wheeler, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, and first of all, um, Chris, say hey to Sarah. She and I work together at DOJ. Uh, oh, cool. She was over there, and so tell her Tom Wheeler says hi. Heck yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask a question about uh, a good friend of mine. Is there a path for a guy like Mike Pence? I heard, are we, are we just doomed to a Ron DeSantis, Trump uh, wallow in the mud uh, for the primaries? Well, here's the thing. We don't know. 
and the strong overdeterminalism of primary coverage is not new, right? This is the way it's going to be. I call Trump the mega Jeb Bush. Uh, he is highest name ID. He has the money. He is in the position of power. It is his to lose, right? Okay, there you go. There he is. You know what else that makes you? A stationary target. Uh, it makes you a sitting duck. Uh, you're like one of those old scows they pull out for the Navy to do, uh, to, to sight their guns with. And Trump is uh, in a very different position than he was in 2015. So at this point in the 2016 cycle, Donald Trump was making noise like he's going to run for president, right? He's going to, well, maybe he did because he played with it in 2012 with the birther thing. And so maybe he's going to run, maybe he's going to run. And Republicans are either thinking of how they will be advantaged by it, right? That he will hurt people that will help them uh, or that they are going to ignore him completely. He had no priors. He came in, he could say or do anything. And people say, well, I was always against the Iraq war. Well, here's the tape of you supporting the invasion of Iraq. Well, I, I didn't, and George Bush should be impeached. There were no, he was not accountable in any meaningful way because he was new. He did not seem to, he seemed to have walked in from someplace else. And that was a big part of his appeal because he was super flexible. Well, Trump has got tons of priors now, right? So when we talk about Afghanistan, it's a different conversation for Donald Trump than it is for anybody on stage, except for maybe Mike Pompeo and maybe Pence. Um, it's different. When we talk about, and worst of all for Trump, when you talk about the 2020 election, the man cannot release, right? He is, he is stuck on this thing. And Republicans know it's a loser, right? And you saw it in the, in the way that the 2022 midterm results were received. It's a loser. And the Republicans know it. Sure loserism does not work. And uh, so Trump is in a very... Trump is in a different position, obviously, than he was in running as an incumbent, but he's also in a different position than he was when he was a radical, a free radical inside the organism in 2016. Will it be Trump DeSantis from pen to post, the two of them going head to head? I doubt it. That's not how, I'll, or maybe I'll put it this way. That's not generally how nominating contests go, right? Uh, or otherwise, Rudy Giuliani uh, would have lost to Hillary Clinton uh, in the 2008 presidential uh, election. Um, that's the, being a, Donald Trump was very unique in a lot of ways in 2016, but in no way more unique than this. He was the front runner the whole time. In a very divided Republican field, he ooched out to be a narrow front runner with like 30% of the vote fairly early. Um, still in the probably late summer of 2015, uh, fall of 2015. And he stayed in that position until Super Tuesday was done. He stayed there. He was the front runner from pen to post. That doesn't happen usually, right? What usually happens is there are lead changes along the way. Um, Republicans have taken lessons from 2020 and Republicans have taken lessons from 2022, right? It's a different machine than it was before and voters have different inputs to make now. So I think Mike Pence has a chance. Um, I think mm. Mike, I, I think Mike Pence, well, I'll put it this way. I think there's gonna be, I don't do lanes, but I do tiers. Uh, and Pence is a second tier candidate right now, but you hang around in the second term or in the second tier long enough, maybe you get to the first tier. And what Republicans may end up with, well, here's how you chart the path for Mike Pence. Trump and DeSantis bloody each other to such a degree that Republicans start looking for someone who is not damaged goods. And the, what you're always looking for in a nominating process is who is the straddle candidate? Who is the person who can have one foot in this camp and one foot in the other camp? Think of George W. Bush. What made George W. Bush the easy win for the nomination in 2000? He was of the establishment, literally born of the purest core of the Republican establishment, but had uh, purchase in 
the evangelical, the, what, what was then the ascendant evangelical movement uh, in the Republican Party. You got you to gotta be able to speak two languages to, be, uh, to win a party's nomination. And Pence can do that because I'll tell you this much, the Republican establishment would run to Mike Pence uh, throwing uh, palm fronds at his feet uh, if they thought that he could be the nominee, which is something that wouldn't have been true when Pence explored a run in 2016. So as my old daddy used to say, get a hunch and bet a bunch. Our next question comes from Jim Rolf, um, who has a very similar and John Nana tag team on this. So Jim, do you wanna ask the question? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about Kevin McCarthy being the next speaker. And some of your comments this morning about, let me describe it as infighting in the Republican Party, uh, is something that he's need to, he needs to create a balancing act, if you will, to get that nomination. Uh, one, can he do that? Two, if he can't, who else might surface as a likely speaker? Well, the um, I, first of all, let me say that I had been looking for a decent Midwestern mustache all morning, and finally we have a questioner <laughs> who bring who represents what I expect from America's heartland. Um, uh, look. Kevin McCarthy is, uh, I wrote today uh, that, uh, or for today that, uh, that Kevin McCarthy's slogan is better than nothing. Uh, and that's what he needs, right? Because the reason that Kevin McCarthy is the favorite to be the speaker still is that, or who? And as long as Steve Scalise doesn't say me too, there is no one else right now that can, so think about it, think about it this way. Uh, John Boehner called him the chucklehead caucus. Uh, it's the 30 or 40 members who are MAGA E, super MAGA E, super, this is like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and you know, those folks. Um, the squad, the red, the, the squad of the red side. Uh, but they're, they're pretty large in number. They're larger in number than the squad is on the Democratic side. Um, but they are, nothing like the majority of the Republican party in the house. Most of the Republicans in the house are normal. Most of the Republicans in the house are traditional mainstream Republicans. Um, and what makes it different is they won't blow up the party to get their way. Whereas the Freedom Caucus will, right? So that what makes them, what, what makes the, the warfare asymmetrical is that the majority will not use the same tactics as the minority. And it, that's for a lot of reasons, um, but the best reason that that's true is the people in the majority know that if you start down that path of, of suicide, suicidal ideation in a, par, in a party, you will succeed, right? Um, uh, as Abraham Lincoln said, we will either endure all time as a nation of free men or we will die by suicide. That applies to republics and that applies to parties. And the main, mainstream Republicans know that's true. So the Freedom Caucus takes advantage of that. And McCarthy right now does not have the votes to get elected speaker. Uh, he can only afford to lose four, depending on the recount in Colorado, but looks like four will be as many as he can give up. And there are at least five who have said under blood oath that under no circumstances will they vote for Kevin McCarthy. Now, that means on the first ballot, probably. What happens in subsequent, we haven't had a second ballot in, no, the 50s maybe? It's been a long time. It's been a minute since we've had multiple ballots for speaker because normally parties are not this disorganized. Yeah. But here's a scenario. Uh, they humiliate McCarthy on the floor. He can't get through on the first ballot. Then the Republicans exit the floor, go into, into their caucus and the, the Freedom Caucus makes the next demand of what they will do, what it will take to, to get the one or two or three uh, members to change their votes and vote for McCarthy. The question then is, is what they want still palatable to the mainstream? Because 
at some point there's a tipping point, right? Where the mainstream Republicans say too much, like they already are with the Marjorie Taylor Greene stuff. It's, there, there's already a lot of nose holding going on among the normal Republicans over the stuff that McCarthy says and does with the cuckoos. Uh, so there's a tipping point there. So then we get to this next, if they, if they make him go to a second ballot, then you get to another round of negotiation. Can McCarthy give them something that will let them say, say to their supporters, we humiliated the man and here we are and we feel good uh, that will still allow McCarthy to get to 218 point, votes. I think that's a pretty likely, I think it's a plurality likely scenario if McCarthy between now and January 6th or January 3rd uh, can't pick off the votes he needs to get barely to 218 on the first ballot. Um, if, on the other hand, that doesn't happen, uh, Scalise is the guy, right? And Scalise, the, what's saving McCarthy right now is that Scalise is a, uh, being true to his word. He said, I'm going to run for majority leader. I'm going to support you for speaker. That's it. And as long as that's true, McCarthy is the only guy because see, there's nobody on the other side that can get the votes. There, none of the Freedom Caucus. Jim Jordan is not going to get the Republican nomination for Speaker of the House. Uh, so, or the, he's not going to get chosen as Speaker of the House. So for McCarthy, it is uh, he he is there by the grace of Steve Scalise. Um, but if again we get to that first ballot and McCarthy goes down. Maybe Scalise says, and this is what happened to McCarthy last time, if you'll recall. Uh, they didn't get to the first ballot, but it became clear he didn't have the votes. And they said, maybe Paul Ryan can do it. And Steve Scalise could hop, uh, leap over McCarthy again uh, and get there, which would be a truly like Shakespearean tragedy for Kevin McCarthy's political career. Like to, to be so close so often and fail would be really uh, something in American political history would be uh, uh, quite a quite a tale. Um, the least likely scenario uh, is the demands of the Freedom Caucus are so extortionate that the party that the that the, the caucus fractures, uh, and that there is another nominee put forward, and they try to pick off some Democratic votes to get to two eighteen. Right, so that's where you see uh, Fitzpatrick of the problem solvers, or somebody uh, emerge that is a centrist kind of Republican that can get two thirds of the Republicans and a third of the Democrats or whatever uh, to get there. And if we get to that point, then all bets are off. I think it's. I think it's. I will say, I was about to say, highly unlikely. I think it's very unlikely. Uh, non-zero, but very unlikely. Most likely is the Freedom Caucus will bloody and humiliate Kevin McCarthy again, yet again, uh, and then he will finally obtain uh, his his desire. Thirty seconds after which he will say, "Why did I want this so much? Why did I want this? Is a terrible job." And John Boehner will just will cut to a, a shot of John Boehner smoking a Terry tip and laughing hysterically in Cincinnati. Oh, well, this time of the year in Florida. Sure. Right. We're Thank you. Go to Bob, Bob McCormick and then Jerry James uh, and maybe Tim Curtis can get through. Um, Bob McCormick. Uh, Chris, if McCarthy can't get the votes, the Republicans, they, they need the Democrats to support him. And if the Democrats had a chance to retake the House, they get 100% of the vote, right? Wait, what do you mean? Say that again. If a car, if the Republicans commit suicide, the Democrats win the win the spot as the uh, no, no. Well, okay. So you think at the end of the day, the Republicans will say we got to win, so we got to put all this to, uh, to bed and just do it. So I think the most likely scenario is that McCarthy will be able to convince the three or four two, three, four members of the Freedom Caucus to support him, maybe not on the first ballot though. Maybe it's a deeper humiliation and he, and yeah. but that they get there eventually. I think that's still the most likely scenario um, because there just isn't another candidate. There isn't somebody waiting in the wings say, well, this guy'd be pretty good. Now, if the Republicans, the, the Democrats 
are farther from 218. So 218 is the magic number. Yeah. The Democrats are farther from 218 than the Republicans are, even with five holdouts in the Freedom Caucus, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, the, those five votes in the Freedom Caucus aren't going for a Democrat, right? Right. Those, those guys, the people who aren't voting for McCarthy, they want to vote for, you know, Donald Trump Jr. or Ted Nugent, or I don't know what they want to do, but they're definitely not going to vote for um, Hakeem Jeffries to be the Speaker of the House. So the Democrats are farther from the goal line, even then, than the Republicans. So that's when the, the discussion becomes, and this is what I said was the most unlikely, but non-zero possibility. So most likely, McCarthy further humiliated, but eventually obtains his objective and is elected speaker. Second, most likely, Steve Scalise becomes speaker after an impasse inside the Republican conference. Third, most likely, is that the, we go to the fifth ballot or the eighth ballot or there, that, that the, the, the earth is stopped on its axis. And the bulk of the Republican conference caucus says, let the Freedom Caucus go. We're not going to convince them. They're not coming. And they cut a deal with moderate Democrats to get the votes that they need for speaker. And the person who would get elected speaker in that scenario would not be a Democrat, but would be a moderate Republican like Don Bacon from Nebraska, right? It would be a, it would be a, a consensus pick who would be a light red Republican. To get the, the reason it, it, it is unlikely to be a Democrat is Democrats have chosen a leader. His name is Hakeem Jeffries. He has a leadership team and he's in place and he's not getting any Republican votes for speaker, right? He's not getting any Republican votes for speaker, no matter what. And the Democrats aren't going to switch him out. He already won. He's, he's, he's their standard bearer. And I think so. McCarthy wins after further humiliation. Scalise, the replacement, number two. And then number three, uh, moderate Republican uh, gets in after the wheels come off the whole buggy. If, if it goes down to where McCarthy needs the Democrats to back him, what does he have to give them to do that? Oh, McCarthy will never get any Democratic votes. Oh, okay. No, 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 oh, no, no, no. Oh, they, they, will, they, will, they will watch his bones roast in the fire with real delight. Um, who Democrats would support would be somebody like Don Bacon from Nebraska. We could think of the other members of the Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, Fitzpatrick, uh, that there, are, uh, there is a, uh, a small but growing number of uh, moderate suburban Republicans who would be the alternative to McCarthy. So it wouldn't be that McCarthy would make a deal himself with Democrats. It's that he would be defeated, withdraw, and then a new candidate would, would be put forward. Last question, if Trump gets indicted, federal indictment, how does that change his game plan? Uh, I, I mean, it would depend a lot on what he was indicted for. Um, if it's a document handle, if it's a Hillary Clinton kind of thing, he probably handles it uh, like Hillary Clinton did and says, my enemies are trumping up these charges against me. And this is, you know, what your obsession with my document handling is crazy. And this is all political. Um, If it's more serious, I would have to know what the more serious thing was. I think the, I think Trump's problem, I think it's less important. And this has been true for a while now. It's less important what Trump does because Trump is just Trump, right? He is the thing itself uh, and he does not change. The, what does change are Republican attitudes and dealing with Trump. And the problem for Trump with an indictment is if it was, con, if it was perceived by not even a majority of Republicans, but by uh, a, a substantial plurality of Republicans, that it's whether they were politically, the charges were politically motivated or not, that it's just too much baggage with this guy. It's just too much. And I think that's where, the, where Trump is with the Republican Party right now is that his bid price is just way, way too high. It's just way too high. And part of Trump's problem is the pernicious weakness of Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden looks so frail and seems so vulnerable uh, as an incumbent 
that it occurs to Republicans, we don't have to have Trump to beat this guy, right? We don't, there's, Trump doesn't have a, mat. he already lost one once. And he doesn't have any magic beans uh, to beat this guy. So that's Trump's big problem is that uh, his bid price is way too high for the services that he can render right now. Lisa, last, last comment. Um, Chris, I served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Phineas under Bush 43, and I reread the document that I had to sign when I left. I had all the top security clearances that the government can give you. The message in my documents is if you take anything out of here, you go to jail, period, end of subject. Not by accident. Uh, you didn't look at your briefcase. Nothing. Zero. Ask Sandy Berger, right? Yeah. Okay. So Trump's got to be history. That, I've I've heard that one before. I I have I when, when Donald Trump was caught uh, giving hush money to a prostitute, a uh, pornographic actress for uh, a, a keeping quiet a tryst that he had with her at a, after a golf tournament while his wife was convalescing after the birth of their child. People <laughs> said, surely, surely this, this is it. It ain't it. Um, the, uh, like I say, it's not about what Trump will do. It's about what Republicans will do to Trump. And uh, the, the big question right now for the Republican Party is, were the results of 2020. And that's why uh, next week's runoff in Georgia is consequential for Republicans. If Herschel Walker wins in the runoff, it's a big help to Trump, right? Because he can say, oh, we won in the end. We got another, you know, we didn't lose seats. We kept the same number of seats and blah, 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 blah. And I blame Mitch McConnell or whatever uh, because he's invested so much in Herschel Walker. If Herschel Walker loses, then it's another data point for Republicans to say, this is this was Trump's number one pick and he lost a winnable seat. So see. Thank you. And thank, thank you for you your service, great. by the way. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, like I said at the beginning, we'd like to start on time and end on time. I know we're two minutes over. I know there are a number of questions in the queue. Chris, you're coming back, man. And and we may have to do this as cocktails and conversation next time. Ooh, we'll get loose. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for joining us. It, um, Ellie and I were texting. You were phenomenal. I learned a lot. Everybody else learned, I'm sure, enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you, everybody, for your support and engagement in with AEI, supporting AEI, your support of AEI makes this possible, makes Chris's job possible. Um, so thank you. Just thank you, everybody. On that note, this was awesome. And have a great Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Chris.